Well, good morning, everybody. I, I don't know that the words of the song, I don't care about that by fear are, the, are, are exactly what we want to tell you uh, this morning. We, we do care about something, and that is the state of our protein industry in the state. And I think, as you saw in the invite for this, there's a lot of noise out there now about where we are in that market, where we're going, and, and that's of particular importance to North Carolina, the business community, and certainly to the subsector of agriculture. Look, we're really fortunate that you've chosen with your time, which I know is limited and special to join us today. So thanks for being here. We've got a good crowd. We do anticipate others joining us. Just a couple of announcements to get started, one or two. Um, uh, we have you muted. Uh, to avoid any distractions during today's presentation. That's actually a favor to you. I was on a call yesterday where I thought I was muted, but I was not, and I embarrassed myself. Uh, I'm sure that's not hard to believe. Uh, but the second thing I would say is if you have a question, please put that down in the chat box. We will work those questions in at the end of Dr. Brown's presentation and certainly want to get to as many of your questions as possible, and we'll try to do that. Sometimes we'll combine them or sort of massage them a little bit, but uh, please do pop in with questions down there. There is a recording being made of the presentation and of the webinar in general. Uh, that'll be available to you within a couple of days, and a link to that will go out over email. So if you missed something and want to circle back, please feel free to do that. Uh, I do want to introduce our speaker and thank him for being a part of the program. Uh, Dr. Blake Brown has been not only a friend of the chambers now for several years, but a personal friend as well. Uh, has spent almost all of his career at NC State, both in terms of receiving his education uh, and in teaching, uh, is now Professor Emeritus uh, because he has crossed over to that uh, joyous time of retirement. Uh, and the fact that he is getting a check from the state every month allows him to also be a cattle farmer out in the western part of the state. Uh, which helps return him a little bit, if you will, to his roots. I should also say Dr. Brown has qualifications from both Yale and Harvard, in addition to NC State. And I was really fortunate to get to cross paths with him a few years ago up in Washington, D.C., when he was on the Council of Economic Advisors at the White House, a very fast-moving uh, an influential group of economists that come together to advise senior policymakers uh, in an administration. And so really a, a feather in his hat that he had that opportunity and did that uh, so well. Dr. Brown, we're looking forward to your remarks and comments and your observations about where we are in the industry at the moment. Uh, when you've finished your presentation, again, we'll come back to those questions that show up in the chat box. Uh, but with no further ado, let's hear from Dr. Brown. Thank you, Ray. It's good to be with y'all today. So uh, I appreciate Ray asking me. And uh, yes, I did have one distinction in Washington at the White House. Uh, my chief of staff at the Council of Economics Advisors said she, I was the only person she knew that had a stronger accent than Ray Starling. So Ray and I did have some impact in Washington, and it was an honor to be there. And I certainly learned a lot. So um Today, we're going to talk about the protein sector in North Carolina, and in fact, we're going to zoom in on a couple of pieces of that sector because they're so large. So let's go on to the next slide. North Carolina has a menagerie of livestock. We're here at a diverse state, diverse state, no matter whether you're talking about crops or whether you're talking about livestock, we just have a very diverse agriculture. And yes, I'm a cattle farmer. I do some consulting on the side. I always tell folks I have a small farm to support. And so it's important for me to continue doing some of that stuff. But we're going to uh, zoom in on three sectors. And I'll show you just in a, a minute why they're so important. But turkeys, uh, we're a large turkey producing state, usually second in the nation. Hogs, we're usually uh, second or third in the nation in hogs. And broiler chickens. We come in third or fourth, we're right up there with the top uh, three or four uh, roller producing states. We'll go to the next slide and I'll show you why those sectors are so important to us. If you look at farm cash receipts evaluated at the value at the farm gate, livestock, dairy, and poultry make up about 70% of our farm receipts in North Carolina. Very, very large portion, in fact, it's a little hard for me to think of another state where it's that intensive. And really and truly, most of that comes from broilers, which are about $5.7 billion or were in 2021. 
And uh, I make up about 32% of our farm cash receipts. Another 7% from turkeys. That's over a billion dollars in turkeys that we produce. That's more than we used to have in tobacco at its, in its golden era. And hogs, which are uh, around $3.1 billion, or about 22% of our receipts. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the poultry and the hog or the pork sector as we move on. So let's go to the next slide. If you look at the economic contribution of poultry and hog farming and processing, and I went into MPLAN, which is a software program that helps us analyze and evaluate economic impacts of different industries, we'll see that employment in processing and production for poultry and hogs was over 56,000 people in, uh, I think this last data is 2021. Uh, labor income that was paid to those folks, over $3 billion. If you looked at the average salary going into all these sectors, you'd be talking, I think it comes up to being somewhere between forty dollars and $50,000 a year. Output is $21 billion for this sector. That's about 4% of our gross state product in North Carolina. And if you run the economic impact of this sector, you'll see that it's about $44 billion when you consider the, the multiplier effect. So it's a big deal for North Carolina, not just for farms, but also for a lot of people that depend on this sector for their livelihood. Okay, go to the next slide. Broilers, and let me just take a minute here to tell you what a broiler is, because when I looked at registration, I see lots of folks that know more about poultry and hogs than I do. But I also so, saw folks on this registration list that might not be quite as familiar with some of the terminology. Yeah, a broiler is a chicken that's harvested, slaughtered when he is about seven weeks old. And so if you go to the grocery store and you buy chicken breast uh, parts, you can even buy whole chickens. Most of those are bro from broilers. So that's the predominant way that we produce uh, chicken meat in this country. The interesting thing about broilers is, if you look at this map, which comes from USDA's nat uh, statistics, the Ag Book for North Carolina, you'll see the counties uh, where broilers are produced in the state. Look how spread out broiler production is all over the state. We have it in the western Piedmont. We have it in the southern Piedmont. We have it, of course, in southeastern uh, North Carolina, and then the northeast as well. So it is very spread out over the state in terms of where these broilers are produced, and it's very important. Look at the bottom of the graph and look at how that has increased uh, over the last few years. We saw an expansion in broiler production back in the early 2000s, and frankly, I thought this is probably one of the last expansions of this industry we'll see in North Carolina, but that is not the case. We've seen a recent expansion in uh, broiler production throughout the state. Uh, the southeastern part of the state in particular has increased some, but we've seen increases in other parts of the state as well. So this is an industry that continues to grow. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why that's the case as we move on. Okay, next slide. If you look at hogs, uh, another very important industry for North Carolina, as I mentioned, we're usually second or third in hog production. Uh, you'll see that that is very concentrated in the southeastern part of the state with some up in the northeast. And in fact, you know, when we talk about processing, we have the largest hog processing facility in the United States down in Tar Heel, North Carolina. Uh, and in fact, it's one of the larger facilities in the world. Uh, there may be some in China that are larger than it, but it is a very large uh, processing facility. That's with Smithfield Foods. If you look at the hogs number on farms, you'll see that that went up in the uh, uh, around 2016, 17, 18, 19 were pretty uh, heavy years, but it has declined some since then. We'll talk a little bit more about why that's the case, but a lot of this has to do with uh, China and their importation of pork and a disease that they went through with African swine fever, which really reduced their uh, production capacity for a while, but now they've come back. And so one of the reasons we are seeing uh, some of the prices and the production levels we, we do in hogs right now are because that export market has shifted away from us right at the time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. 
if you look at pork exports, and this goes right along with what I was talking about, <clears throat> they really increased in the latter part of the last decade and then kind of spiked in 2020. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what's interesting about this is in 2020, we were in a trade war with China. Excuse me. We, we called it a trade negotiation uh, when I was in D.C. in 2018, 2019. But uh, basically, we had levied tariffs on a lot of Chinese products, and they countered with uh, punitive tariffs on a lot of our products, including pork. Well, then after they had put these punitive tariffs on, they had a devastating disease called African swine fever. Uh, China produces 50% of the world's pork, and they consume 50% of the world's pork. They imported quite a bit of pork. Um, Actually, they, I guess they produced maybe 45 to 46 percent. So they did import some pork. It was huge because it's such a large market, even though it was a very small part of their market. Well, when this disease hit, it got rid of uh, 40 percent of their sow herd. And so you're talking about 20 percent of the global swine herd just going away in a year's time. And so pork is a very important in their diet. Chinese, the Chinese eat more pork than any other uh, uh, people on Earth. And so it was a big deal. And so China had to start importing pork to try to take care of that. And we, uh, despite the punitive tariffs, import, or exported a lot of uh, pork to China during that period. Now they've since rebuilt their hog herd. Uh, they've been very intent on uh, you know, increasing their commercial production. And so that's one reason we see uh, pork exports declining some. If we had 2022 on this graph, they would have declined farther. Uh, but, you know, we have other important customers. In fact, you know, Mexico, prior to the African swine fever, was our largest importer of pork from the United States. And they have reemerged as the largest importer of pork from the United States. So uh, we have some other very strong partners in terms of the export market. Okay. This chart is about poultry. And uh, if you look at poultry exports, the lit yellow portion of that uh, graph is the United States. And you'll see that it's been growing over time. What's really interesting, if you look at global exports of poultry, you'll see that they've grown even more. And uh, the green portion of that chart is Brazil. Brazil is our chief competitor in so many ag markets, whether it's soybeans, corn, cotton, but also in chickens, they have a large vertically integrated industry, just like we have here in the United States. They use uh, almost the same kind of production practices. And in fact, they have a pretty good sized uh, vertically integrated hog industry. And we'll talk just a little bit more about some of the players there uh, when we go forward. But this slide really illustrates how, like all ag products, you know, it's really a global industry. Okay. Here's, been, here's what's been driving that strong uh, export trend in uh, poultry. Uh, we've seen that here in the United States. We've seen that globally, especially in developing countries as uh, they gain more income. The, the orange or burn orange portion of a bar on this is uh, per capita disappearance of poultry. Uh, and so if you look at that, actually it's broiler specifically, just look how it's been growing. And we could take that graph on back to 2000 or 1990, and we would still see that kind of growth. I think the growth has accelerated in the last decade. And so people eat lots of chicken, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One, it is one of the cheapest sources of protein uh, that we have on the planet in terms of good quality animal protein. It's also uh, a good quality protein, as I just said. It tastes good. So it's a good substitute for more expensive uh, protein sources like beef or even pork. And so we see pork, uh, chicken consumption going up all over the world. And so that's one of the main reasons we're seeing production go up, okay? Now, the thing that's really interesting about both the hog industry and the uh, chicken or broiler industry is just the technological advancements that have come about over the past several decades. As I mentioned earlier, the chicken industry is essentially vertically integrated. That means uh, that a, a company will own the 
the chicken from hatching until slaughter. Uh, so the farmer never owns that chicken themselves, but the farmer provides the housing, they provide the management, they provide the labor uh, to grow those chickens out. And they have a contract with a company that then turns and pays them based on the performance of those chickens on that farm. And this uh, chart right here, if you look over to the right hand side, it shows how many pounds of feed or how, I think it's corn actually, how many pounds of corn uh, act, uh, it takes to grow a chicken out. And if you look back at 1925, almost five pounds of corn were required, five pounds of feed were required to make a pound of, of chicken that's edible. 2010, 1.75 pounds of feed to make a pound of bird. And if we had this on out to 2020, we would see continued improvements. And they've done that through a lot of uh, different avenues, as the title on this slide shows, is they've done it through basically genetic improvement, breeding, they've done it through improved nutrition, and their, the environment, the housing, and just the sophistication of these houses that meet the needs of these chickens so that they can grow so rapidly and so they can be so efficient in converting feed is amazing. So technological change and technological improvements in, in the whole spectrum uh, at the production level, okay? Next slide, please. And if you look at hogs, it's, it's really similar. This chart, the blue, uh, the blue bars show commercial pork production uh, in the United States. And the red line shows the breeding herd, the stock of breeding herd that we have. So think about this, the number of sows, the mama pigs has been going down consistently over time, just that downward trend, yet production is going up. And so what's happening is we can have one sow that someone told me yesterday could have 25 pigs in a litter, that that was getting close to what the litter size, I mean, not the litter size, but the, the annual production was. Uh, so you have sows that have more litters per year. You have sows that have more pigs per litter. And like chicken, they're becoming more feed efficient. So we are, have really seen technological change here. And one of the interesting things about this technological change, particularly in the hog industry, is a lot of that started here in North Carolina. It started with companies like Carol's of Warsaw, uh, Murphy, uh, uh, Prestige Farms. Now, a lot of those companies have been merged or bought out. We've seen a lot of consolidation. Now, the two big players in North Carolina are Smithfield Foods, and uh, of course, also Prestige Farms is a big player here. And we have some other hog companies as well here, but we've seen a lot of consolidation, but companies like Hog Slats, if you don't know what Hog Slats is, they provide and manufacture a lot of the infrastructure for the hog industry. And so their global headquarters are in Newton Grove, North Carolina, and they do provide products all over the world for the swine industry in terms of housing and floors and uh, feed handling systems, those kind of things. So a lot of the epicenter of that started here in the 1980s and has really progressed over the last few decades and has a, had a global effect. In fact, we were the first to go to a vertically integrated uh, contract production system for hogs here in North Carolina. And folks in the Midwest, I can remember them saying, it'll never happen here. Well, guess what? Iowa is mostly contract uh, production. There are still some independent farms out there, but that model has followed through other places. And of course, Iowa is the biggest producer of hogs. They dwarf everybody else, but we're still very, very significant. Next slide, please. Who are the players here? Okay, you look at that list and you say, well, I see a couple of names there that I recognize. If you're from the West, if you travel through the Western part of the Piedmont, you'll probably see uh, chicken houses with a Tyson sign out front, or you may see Tyson feed uh, trucks on the road. So you recognize Tyson is a major producer of, of chickens or poultry. And you see those in North Carolina and you say, well, I, I know about Smithfield Foods because they've got that huge processing plant down in Tar Hill, and they're the major, you know, you see their signs and their trucks running all over Eastern North Carolina, but you might not recognize the other names. Well, there are some names under these companies that you will recognize. JBS, which is, this is the U.S. subsidiary of uh, JBS. JBS is the largest protein 
company in the world. They're the largest meat producer in the world. JBS uh, SA is the Brazilian company. That's where it's headquartered in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, their U.S. subsidiary is JBS USA. And you say, well, I haven't ever seen a JBS chicken house. Well, uh, you know, have you heard of Pilgrim's Pride? That's one of the integrators here in North Carolina that produces broilers. Well, Pilgrim's Pride is owned by JBS USA. Well, you say, I've never seen a Cargill chicken house. Well, has anybody ever seen a sign out front that says Sanderson Farms? If you go to the southeastern part of our state where there was a major expansion several years ago, you'll see lots of Sanderson Farms uh, um, chicken houses there. And you'll also realize we have a poultry processing plant that they put in place in the southeastern part of our state as well. So Sanderson Farms is wholly owned by Cargill, which is a privately owned uh, company. Then we have Smithfield Foods that we know about. Well, in 2013, they were bought by a Chinese company, WH Holdings. WH Holdings is the largest pork producer in the world. They're based in Hong Kong and have lots of operations in China, and they own Smithfield Foods. And some, not a huge amount, but some of Smithfield Foods hog production does go to WA or does go to China. Okay. Well, let's just briefly mention the current market outlook for these two, and then we'll talk about some of the issues surrounding it. Well, chicken and eggs, it's, it's pretty good. Now, they came off, uh, I think maybe last year, the year before, a, a time of really strong profits. Uh, and basically, that goes back to just the increased demand from increased consumption of chicken. I think they kind of caught up with that as we normally do in agriculture and their production is caught up. So it's not quite as prosperous looking now, but, you know, basically the outlook for this industry is still very strong because of that increasing U.S. consumption and that increasing global consumption. Uh, they're exporting a lot of their crop, uh, but yep, broiler production was up about, is up about 7% from last year and prices are down about 17% but still a very strong outlook for this. One of the issues that they have struggled with over the last few years uh, are high feed prices. We've had very strong corn and soybean prices and uh, that has had a pretty big effect on our uh, hog and poultry industry um, just because they have to pass those along. So that's one of the reasons we've seen, you know, uh, sort of this downturn in profits this year as well. Okay, next slide. If you talk about pork, uh, I didn't mention it, but if we went back to our consumption slide, slide on pork, you'll see that it's kind of rocking along, trending up slightly, certainly not like uh, poultry is. We did, as I mentioned, see that real uptick in exports and demand a few years ago because China had to go out and get their pork from somewhere else in the world. We've kind of seen that go away. We've seen pork production come down some but they are coming out of a very difficult period where over the last 10 or 12 months, their prices have been such that they were below the cost of production. Now, my understanding and reading of some of the analysis for some of the folks that really uh, analyze this industry is that they're probably coming back to a period this fall where they may be at break even or slightly above break even. We're not gonna see them go back at least this year to uh, those profits they had back when exports were really strong. Um, but, you know, it, it's not going to be hopefully a situation where they're underwater. Just like uh, chickens, one of the big things they're dealing with are high feed costs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay. Here's where we've been with uh, feed cost. And we don't have to worry about the alfalfa hay of this, but let's look at the corn and the soybean meal. This is percent change from the period 2016 to 2020, how much prices have changed since that period. And you'll see there in 2022, they're kind of speaking, uh, peaking out there around 30, um, 35 percent or 135% over what they were during this previous period. And so they've gone up a lot. And so um, uh, we're looking at that situation now. We seen corn moderate quite a bit. If we move forward into 2023, we would see corn 
Now, I think the December futures is around $5.37 a bushel. That's considerably less than the $8 or almost $8 we were seeing uh, just a few years ago. So it is improving for livestock producers. By the way, we are a corn deficit state. In other words, we have so many hogs and chickens and turkeys that uh, you know we have to bring corn into our state. We can't produce enough to feed this industry. That's good for our corn farmers because you know if their prices uh, that they're get in the Midwest are five dollars and sixty cents a bushel for corn. Our producers will generally get about a positive basis of one dollar a bushel, so they'll be getting uh, you know six dollars and sixty cents rather than five dollars and sixty cents. So because of that, we've seen a big increase in corn production in the Carolinas in the southeast because we have this deficit area and there's a big demand for corn locally because it's expensive to transport especially by rail from the Midwest. If you look at soybean meal, that's the other big component in, uh, in, in hog rations and chicken rations. You can see that that orange portion of the bar has gone up too. It's not gone up as much percentage wise, but soybeans are still pretty strong. They're still uh, between 14 and $15 a bushel. <clears throat> and of course, you know, right now, what makes the big difference when we're looking at corn the outlook is really in corn, especially is dependent on two things. One is just the weather. That's always the big if right now, especially this time of year in July. You know, I think in the Midwest, they're still seeing corn in pollination stages out there. And that's critical that you have good weather, not too much heat and you have enough water. Uh, we're past that stage, of course, in the Southeast. Uh, the other big factor is besides weather is the war in Ukraine. Ukraine is a major global producer of corn. And because of the war, their corn crop is down about 27% this year. So, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Last year, they had their corn planted before the war really took effect. So they didn't really see production go down as much last year. But what happened was the Russians seized a lot of that uh, crop and they it got onto the world market, not in the way that the Ukrainians would have liked for it to have, but it did make it in its way into the global markets. So we didn't have a crisis because there wasn't enough corn because a lot of developing nations depend on this not to feed animals, but to feed their people. This year, you know, it just, the war impeded planning for one thing, and with so much uncertainty with that going on. So we'll have to continue to watch that to see how that plays out. It looks like we're gonna have a good crop here in the US, but again, weather's the biggest factor right now. But regardless, we've seen corn prices moderate some and that has helped the animal sector, okay? Let's talk about some of the major issues and we could spend days talking about this. Uh, of course, everyone has seen in the news the nuisance lawsuits that were uh, uh, put against the hog industry in North Carolina a few years ago. Uh, the uh, plaintiffs did prevail in getting a settlement from Smithfield uh, Foods. Uh, we are fortunate in the sense that we have been strengthening. We had pretty strong right to farm laws here in the United, in North Carolina, and our General Assembly has made those even stronger. So, uh, you know, Ray could speak to this a lot more clearly than I could being an attorney, but I used to have an attorney friend that I would ask questions fairly frequently, and anytime I would say, could I be sued, he would cut me off right there and he'd say, yes, the answer is always yes, a lawsuit could be filed. But I think what happens with these right to farm laws, they make it less lucrative for outside law firms to come in and uh, start a class action suit like we saw earlier. So I wouldn't say that we're completely protected, but certainly we're fortunate to have sort of the strengthening of some of these laws. One of the reasons we're seeing a lot of this is urban encroachment. North Carolina is a very fast uh, growing state, growing faster than ever. And that urban growth stretches out even to the, into the most rural parts of our state. And then there's issues that continually come up about animal welfare. Fair. There was a series of articles produced in the uh, Charlotte Observer, a very uh, nasty take on their take on the uh, chicken production industry. 
uh, really was not very objective at all. You know, when I was doing this in this uh, research, I ran across, uh, I think it was the Duke University undergraduate law school letter, and they had written one about the pork lawsuits. And oh my goodness, I kind of thought, you know, academic institution, maybe they'll be somewhat objective, but they didn't get their facts right, and they were very, very derogatory about the way hogs were raised. I mean, they just got some things just blatantly wrong. And so you're always a little shocked, especially when it's in that academic institution, when uh, there's just, it's just not factual. And uh, unfortunately, we get a lot of bad press like that, and it only takes one incidence to, uh, to really hurt this sector. So that's always a concern. Waste management, been an issue in the news for 25 years now. In fact, uh, if you're not familiar with this industry, you may not know, but Governor Jim Hunt, Hunt back in the late 90s, he put a moratorium in place on lagoon capacity, and lagoons are the way that we manage waste on large hog operations, and so that really slowed the growth here. Any growth we've had since that time in North Carolina in the hog industry has basically been through technological change so that they could produce more pounds uh, with the same waste, waste management system, and we continue to see, you know, now we, we see the tear down or the tearing down of a number of hog facilities, and they build back one that's more efficient, uh, that can produce more pounds of pork, even with the same lagoon permit. So, but that continues to be an issue. And there's always regulatory pressure. Uh, no, uh, this is not just true of the livestock industry, but true of uh, all of agriculture, but we especially see that uh, in the livestock, the poultry, and the hog industry. So these are all issues we kind of have to keep in mind as we move forward, because a lot of these issues are not going away, no matter how hard we work on them. All right, next slide, please. All right, well, I want to leave you with a zinger today, something to think about. As we talked about, technological change has really been what has propelled the productivity in the poultry and the hog sector. Technological change is the way that these sectors have basically been able to provide an economical source of protein, not just from the United States, but for people in uh, developing countries. As people come out of poverty, they want to eat more protein, they want to improve their diets, and so technological change is really one of the ways that we've been able to meet this huge need, and the need is going to get bigger, right? We're going to have to produce a lot more food. So with that background, look at this quote from Winston Churchill, 1931. Winston Churchill said, we shall escape the absurdity of growing a whole chicken in order to eat the breast or wing by growing these parts separately under a suitable medium. Wow. And this was this kind of quote was before Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World, if any of you read that book. But how prophetic this is, because as we see, as we go to the next slide, wow, we're talking about lab-grown meat. How many of y'all have heard about believer meats? I'll tell you more about that one in a, in a minute. That's right here in North Carolina. But this slide is one of the first ones in the world. Good meat. And I want you to look at some of the way they're marketing this. Good meat is owned by a company in San Francisco called Eat Just, implied in justly. And in, in this country, they produce a vegan egg product. And they, in Singapore, are uh, growing lab-grown chicken meat chicken breast, essentially. That was the first place in the world where, uh, you know, we saw lab-grown meat be cleared to eat for the general population. This has been cleared there for about three years now, and so it's evidently going fairly well. Consumers like it because it does taste like chicken, and according to this company, they have not got to a point where they're making profits yet with it, but they're saying that their cost of production comes down every year. We've been able to do lab-grown meat for decades, but it was extraordinarily expensive, way too expensive to be grown on a commercial scale. But now it looks like these companies have developed a way to grow it economically. And in fact, uh, well, before we talk about FDA and their clearance, look at the slogan that good meat has. Good meat is real meat 
but made without tearing down a forest or taking a single life. Oh my goodness. Now look, I'm a cattle producer. I've worked with a lot of hog guys and a lot of chicken farmers. And it's a really important to our state. And you know, this kind of hits me wrong when I read it, but that's the way they're marketing it. So what are they saying? You don't have to you don't have to tear down the Amazon rainforest. Well, we never did, but that's kind of what they're implying. And uh, you don't have to kill an animal. And so they're appealing to that part of the, the consumers for this. So it, it's coming because now in June, we had the first lab grown meat is cleared for sale in the United States and it's gonna be chicken. FDA has cleared it. In fact, when I was in DC, um, a few years ago, USDA and FDA were having a little spats, what I would call it, at least that's what it looked like to me, over who was going to get to have a purview over this cultured meat or lab-grown meat market. And so uh, as it winds up, they both won. They both have a purview over it. I guess FDA gets to is the one that has to clear the permits to do it, and USDA will be inspecting it, if I understand it correctly. So this is coming. There's a bunch of these requests for permits to sell cultured meat or lab-grown meat in the United States in the pipeline at FDA. And so we're gonna see more and more about this. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, you heard me say Believer Meats just a minute ago. Uh, I want y'all to, to think in your mind, now where is that gonna be? Well, it's gonna be in Wilson County. They broke ground in December. It is going to be the largest cultured meat facility in the world. It uh, is a, an Israeli company, but they have a lot of investors from the U.S. Uh, those investors include people like our companies like Tyson Foods. Remember, Tyson is one of the largest chicken integrators in the United States. So it's happening. And when this is done, if I remember correctly, I tried to do the conversion but they're gonna be producing about as much as our third largest poultry producing county in North Carolina, that would be Anson County. And right now, the number of pounds just slips my mind, but it's a huge amount when it gets up and running. Now, right now we're seeing all this uh, really be for chicken. Can it be done for other meats? Well, yes, uh, much to my chagrin, they can uh, do uh, lab-grown steaks. Uh, the company I mentioned previously, the Good Meats Company, is working on a lab-grown um, uh, um, steak that would be one of the prime steaks that you could eat. And so I don't know how it will play out. Uh, when you look at um, the poultry and swine industry, especially poultry, then you see that this is probably could be quite feasible and it could succeed uh, quite well. Cattle are a little different because cattle spend most of their life, despite what you may hear, uh, a steer that's fed out to be slaughtered spends about 80% of his life on grass and in eating forages before he ever gets any grain. Uh, whereas chickens and hogs are fed grain, pretty much uh, grain is corn and soybean meal their whole life. Uh, so where's this gonna go? I don't know exactly, but I will say this, uh, you know, technologies, if you think about any technology, uh, computers, personal computers, calculators, whatever it might be, they usually look pretty clunky when they first come out. They're usually quite expensive when they first come out. There's a lot of uncertainty about them when they come out because some technologies succeed and others don't. But, you know, if it meets a need, if it can be produced economically, then those technologies generally prevail. And we look back and we're surprised at people uh, who said, ah, oh, we'll never have personal computers on every desk. And those kind of statements were made. So I'm very careful about, uh, you know, talking about this technology because frankly, our current swine and poultry industry, as I mentioned earlier, has come about, is so productive because of dramatic technological change. And a lot of that, as I mentioned earlier, happened here in North Carolina. And I can remember uh, as a young county agent, my first job, livestock agent, talking to my hawk producers, and I had looked a lot at the chicken industry, which was already vertically integrated, and saying to them, wow, it looks to me like the hog industry is right for this. I bet you we're going to vertically integrate too. And they're, no, there's no way. 
uh, farmers, especially in the Midwest, were very like, oh, that'll never happen to us. I was even uh, uh, almost disciplined, I guess, by one extension swine pest specialist at the university back then. He was the head, the head of extension swine husbandry. He was like, that'll never happen in North Carolina. Well, guess what? In 10 years, it had happened. The industry, it was totally vert vertically integrated in North Carolina. The technolo technology for producing hogs had totally changed the industry. And, you know, so we'll see what happens here. Next slide, please. Here's a website you can go to, Good Food Institute. Now, it's not necessarily all objective information. It is a website that a coalition of companies that are wanting to produce lab-grown meat uh, you know, they put this website up there. You've got a lot of information. Just remember, it's from their perspective, not necessarily objective every time. They want to show you how much better this would be than conventionally produced meat with animals. Now, I will say, I, I don't know exactly, you know, I certainly, I'm not a futurist. I don't know exactly how this is going to play out. But one of the reasons we have seen the vegan meat, meat options kind of sputter and stall, uh, even some one company looks like it may go belly up, you know, that we're producing vegan burgers, you know, uh, I forgot the name right now of the, of the burger that was so popular, but basically, uh, you know, it has to be a close substitute. It has to taste like meat. Secondly, I don't know that there's many of us that are carnivores or omnivores, I guess, that were really looking for a vegan substitute. And uh, vegans had already decided what they were going to eat. They really didn't need to eat a vegan hamburger. So the market's probably pretty limited, and that's why we've seen it sputter. It kind of reminds me of the e-cigarette market uh, in, in tobacco, because the e-cigarettes have turned out not to be nearly as disruptive as we thought. And they're just not a close substitute to a, a regular cigarette. So I don't know. It's all going to depend. Let's go to the next slide. It's all going to depend probably on uh, how close of a substance it meets. Now, there are some, some other really driving forces that make me think that we better take this uh, change pretty seriously. One, as the good meats you know, you know, made very plain on their website, it reduces animal welfare concerns because you don't have to kill an animal. It may be more feed efficient. Now, let's think about that one just a second. I haven't been able to find out exactly how they made make the feed for this uh, chicken meat that they're going to be growing there in the, in the plant in Wilson. But it has to go from a raw feed ingredient, like probably corn and soybeans, to a medium that can be directly fed to the muscles. And that's what the chicken does, right? They have a digestive system that takes raw feed ingredients and converts it into uh, a medium that can grow their muscles. Um, they have bones that are basically the structure like a factory. So here's Blake Brown's crude analogy here. It's going to depend on, because that factory has to essentially be the digestive system. Is it more efficient to have on a, a large industrial scale where you can take feed ingredients and then turn them into a medium to grow the muscles in the, uh, the cultured meat, uh, probably it will be. To, you know, you may be able to do that on an industrial scale more efficiently than you can have an digestive system in each animal. That's kind of the way I think about it. You don't have to have the bone structure. You don't have to have all the parts that uh, may be lower value parts on the chicken. Now, but that introduces its own kind of problem because there are very few parts of an animal, chicken or hog, that are not used in some way. The offal or the, the guts from hogs, those go into important markets. Uh, Mexico imports a lot of those uh, products that we might not value as much here. Chicken feet, <laughs> a lot of those get shipped to Asia. They're all exported, there's no waste there. So how do you address those kinds of markets if all of a sudden you're able to grow your chicken breast, which is obviously the premium market for chicken, uh, and then you're not going to have all those parts with it. <clears throat> so lots of questions to be answered and see how that works. Uh, now, it reduces waste management issues, but now hold on. I mean, if you're feeding 
and growing a living tissue, you are going to have waste. So there are is waste that you're going to have to deal with. It may be much easier dealt with than, you know, waste from lots of individual animals. I don't know. That's another question we have. And, you know, it, it eliminates the need for thousands of contracts with farmers. So whenever you think about a company like Tyson or Sanderson Farms or Smithfield Foods, you think they're looking at this? Yes, and that's why some of them are also investing in these alternative technologies because they have to stay on top of what kind of technological change is coming. The question is, one of the big questions for the producers, is it a lower cost of production? Could be, that's what we have to see. According to Good Meats, they haven't quite got there yet, but uh, they feel like they're getting it down to where it's pretty close to the competitive uh, cost production with uh, conventional chicken production. We'll have to wait and see. Is it more environmentally friendly? This is one that kind of shot me. I kind of figured the answer would be yes. It's not necessarily. Uh, it's a bigger user of electricity, evidently, and it sort of depends. If the electricity is is uh, done in an environmentally friendly way, in other words, not coal, or or maybe it comes from uh, you know wind or solar, then yes, it may be more environmentally friendly, but not necessarily. That's a little different. Is it safe? Well, FDA has started approving these permits, so yes, it's probably safe, but what's really going to be important there is do consumers feel like it's safe? <clears throat> a lot of the same folks that are big wealth, animal welfare advocates and that cause a lot of pain to the current industry are going to cry frankenmeat whenever this comes out. Uh, if you remember when GMOs started emerging 20, 25 years ago, a lot of controversy, especially in Europe, you know, um, franken crops, you know, these were a lot of really bad press. However, how many consumers in the U.S. eat GMOs now? Well, just about all of us eat GMOs because it's everywhere. And so far, so good on safety. And you might survey uh, consumers and they might say, uh, you know, I don't really want to eat GMOs, but they're going to go in the grocery store and buy it and never know the difference. So, but the big one, I think, the big ones for consumers are taste and price. Does it taste like the chicken breast that I've been buying that's conventionally made? Is it as cheap? And I guarantee you, if, the, if it passed the taste test, in other words, it's, it's an exact substitute for chicken meat, in this case, or pork or whatever they do, then if the price is right, uh, consumers are going to buy it. So this is the zinger I'm going to leave you with. Uh, this industry has been characterized by tremendous technological change. Uh, we've got to keep a close eye on this technological change because think about it. If this does take off, how will it change North Carolina? And I'll leave you with that and close it and we'll have time for some questions. Dr. Brown, thanks for a, for a, in, you know, a deep, presentation uh, that was broad as well. I mean, you covered a lot of ground there. Uh, I want to give just a moment as you maybe catch your breath and we get ready to move into some of these questions. I know that Roy Lee Lindsay is on the call. Roy is our CEO of the Port Council, uh, which as you look at that pie of animal protein in the state, uh, pork is a very big part of that, as you pointed out. Uh, Roy Lee and the Port Council are good friends of the chamber. Uh, he's actually on travel today, but has agreed to be with us for just a moment to say, what are you seeing out there, Roy? What are you feeling? And is there anything you'd like to add? We'll we'll yield the floor to you for just a moment. Well, thanks, Ray. Can you hear me okay? You're coming yep. through loud and clear. Good. Can you see me? Because I don't see what, I'm, what I look like, and I want to make sure I look good on video. You are absolutely stunning, uh, Roy Lee. Thank you. Uh, a couple of things here. Dr. Brown did a really nice job talking about the economics of what's happening across agriculture kind of in general, but let's give you some perspective of what I think we're seeing in, in North Carolina in general. Six months ago, we were estimating that average losses on a market hog were between 40 and $50 a head. Um, so for perspective, we're going to have roughly 17 million pigs born in North Carolina this year. So you do the math on $40 losses on 17 million hogs. We're, we're talking real numbers, even if you're asking the federal government, if that's a big number. Um, 
Today, with the price of corn coming down, we think those losses are back under about $30. Uh, and maybe our producers are a little more efficient than most. Um, but we continue to see what those losses are. Maybe we get close to break even by the end of 23. Uh, but 24 looks like it could be a very challenging year, especially if the corn crop doesn't come in the way it's projected. So I think long term, still not a lot of positive out there in terms of the market. but uh, it's better than it was six months ago. We, we can at least say that. I think this is leading to some changes in North Carolina within the industry that, that will happen. Um, we've not built a new farm in North Carolina, as Dr. Brown alluded, since 1997. Um, we cannot build a new farm unless we change away from the lagoon and spray field system. And to install those kinds of technologies are actually cost prohibitive. Um, they, they, we're no longer competitive if we do that. And and number one rule of sustainability is you got to be profitable to be sustainable. So making a change to something else, just because we think it's a better waste handling system, if we can't stay in business, then it's it's not sustainable. We are seeing some, some changes here for us as it relates to sustainability. We're seeing a movement toward uh, adding digesters to our lagoons, covering those lagoons, capturing the methane, and creating renewable natural gas. Um, that's a process that we believe will reduce odor, it reduces air emissions, it reduces our carbon footprint, and it provides a new revenue stream for producers that will not only pay for the infrastructure, but also will provide them another revenue stream on down the road. And so we think that's, we're really kind of on the edge of this, the precipice of it. But uh, uh, Smithfield, for example, will estimate that by the time they're done with their investment in RNG, 90% of their finishing farms in North Carolina, which is a big number of farms, will all have digesters and will all be creating renewable natural gas. So I think that's a, a, a tremendous positive for us. In terms of, of sustainability in the future, you know, as we look down the road, we think that livestock is part of the solution, not the problem. Um, and if you go back historically, and, and Dr. Brown showed you, I thought they were great stats when he showed you that conversion on chicken. We went from a two pound chicken that took four and a half pounds of feed to get him, you know, to get a pound to a six pound chicken that only takes one and three quarter pounds of feed. So we're producing way more chicken for way less feed. Same thing applies in the pork industry. We use 25% less water today than we did uh, 50 years ago. We use 9% less energy than we did in the past. What does 9% less energy look like to you? Go unplug your refrigerator for a year and see how you'd like that. That's what 9% less energy means on your farm. 25% less water, uh, eliminate a shower every day. Take one shower, you know, eliminate two showers a week. That's about 25% less water. Think about what that means in terms of you on your, on your piece of land. Now, um, we're also dealing, in, and he mentioned issues in animal welfare. We've been dealing with changes in the marketplace as it relates to how we raise animals. California passed a, a, a ballot initiative in 2018 called Proposition 12 that mandated a certain space, a certain amount of space for every breeding animal that we have in production. If you want to sell pork in California, you have to house your sows in accordance with their standards in California, regardless of where you live in the United States. I want to say thank you right now to Ray and the folks at the Chamber and the Chamber Legal Institute for joining with us and, and North Carolina Farm Bureau on a series of briefs to the U.S. Supreme Court. We challenged Proposition 12 all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, lost uh, that challenge, I guess, in a 5-4 ruling, but we greatly appreciate the effort that the Chamber and, and our other friends in North Carolina helped us with those briefs. What this means is that California is now dictating to the rest of the country how pork will be raised if you want to sell it in California. Uh, California is roughly 13, 14% of all the pork consumption in the country. So there's going to be some concessions made to California. Uh, what we don't know is, is there enough product out there right now? Um, is there, uh, uh, is there going to be enough pork on the shelves when they go into, when they say that, Hey, January one, every piece of pork that's sold in California will be compliant with proposition 12. Will there be empty shelves? What does that look like? We don't know that answer. I'm not going to speculate on what that is. Um, but I, I don't want to leave everybody with the notion that things are, are horrible because uh, the future's not, the future's bright, I think, for American agriculture and, and the pork industry in particular. Uh, 
Dr. Brown mentioned disease pressures in China. China is the world's largest pork producer. They have half the world's hogs. Okay, uh, they're still dealing with disease pressures. They have not been able to get their hands around it. If they're going to continue to feed their people pork, ultimately they're going to buy pork from somewhere. They may not buy it from the United States. They may buy it from someone else, but that will open up other opportunities for us to sell pork around the world. And we are the best pork producer in the world in terms of cost, in terms of safety, in terms of efficiency. No one can compete with us. In Europe, you're seeing the European Union reduce their herd. Uh, you're seeing governments in Europe actually tell farmers, we're closing your farm because we want to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, it's a it's an absolute joke, if you will, in terms of what that contributes to overall carbon footprint, overall carbon impact, if you will. But that means there's going to be less pork available coming from major exporting countries like Germany. Um, that's going to create additional opportunities for us here in the United States. All of that, I think, long term bodes very well for us. But the interim here, the next 12 months, the next 24 could be very challenging as a as an industry. So did I, did I get what you wanted there, Ray, or is there something else you want to, you want to well, address? I'm always impressed with uh, how you articulate so much in just a couple of minutes there across the entire uh, view of the sector of the pork sector in particular. So I thought you nailed it. I thought that was a great review. And, and frankly, I sit here humbled at all you have to monitor and watch. And so uh, thanks for mentioning the California market. I thought that was interesting. The global market, uh, and then just hopefully the, the optimism there at the end. I appreciate that as well. Anybody that knows you knows uh, that that's also a part of who you are. So thanks for doing that. And if Thank you need you. to return to your yep. meeting, welcome to, but we'd love for you to stick around too. Um, I'll stick around in case there's a question you, you want me to address. Sure. I'll hang around. Sure. Go ahead and uh, mute yourself then, Roy Lee, for now. But, uh, but there is some, I'll come back to Dr. Brown. There is some interesting debate in our chat box, which is fun. You know, we got a pretty big tent here at the chamber. And, and I think in this conversation, if you will, uh, Dr. Brown, about uh, meat or no meat, uh, it, the conversation tends to veer really far in one direction or another, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, you certainly seem to be a person that thinks there's going to be a little bit of middle ground accomplished there at some point. I mean, have I summarized your thoughts on that, right? I mean, give us a framework of, of, of maybe at some point and how many years down the road uh, we may see a certain percentage of the market be cultivated meat or something else. Shot in the dark, I know, but I'm curious. Yeah, that, that is very speculative, but I think it's quite possible. Yeah, I've been looking at some of the chat. I think one of the things that we have to understand in the United States, we're a very affluent nation. This is one of the places on earth where if you want to be a vegetarian, you could probably have the affluence to put together enough different plant proteins that you can eat. Uh, most of the world's not like that. Most of the third world really needs to improve the quality of their protein and the amount of protein in their diet in order to improve their, their population's diet. So we have to be really careful when we become a little uh, high and mighty on that end because if we're going to feed this world population, uh, part of that has to be improving the quality and amount of protein that a lot of people around the world get. So, uh, and, and we're going to probably do that through technology. And we've seen, as I mentioned earlier, that technological change in uh, very much so in the chicken industry and the hog industry. Uh, Roy did a really good uh, job articulating, you know, what's going on in the hog industry. Uh, Proposition 12, I meant to mention that one. That's a really, really important one, you know, and it'll be interesting to see how uh, the industry reacts. We have in chickens, and remember this has already been in, uh, impacting egg production, is we've seen uh, sort of a two-tiered market. We see companies providing cage-free eggs. Uh, you're going to see companies providing uh, uh, free-range chicken. So uh, it, I, I think it makes it difficult, but I don't think we're going to see uh, the whole country go to adopting uh, 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 these kind of production practices for the whole industry because not all consumers can afford that or want to afford it. So, so we'll, it'll be interesting to see, but I think we're probably going to see a, a two-tier market structure. 
Uh, local food has had a big impact. I mean, it's still a very, very small percentage of, of what we eat. In fact, my family, they have a retail fee, uh, beef business. So I'm very thankful for that and people that want to buy locally and pay a premium for it. But a lot of the world's population, especially, but uh, um, also, you know, here in the United States, a lot of people that does impact their ability to have protein in their diet. So we have to be able to provide that economically for them. Great answer. Uh, it's always fun to put an economist on the spot. Yeah, I think you'd be a very, very good politician there, uh, Dr. Brown. That was that was well I've been said. around a lot of them. So. <laughs> you have. And in fact, what you do is uh, sometimes advise policymakers. You were a very big part of the tobacco buyout back uh, a couple, you know, many years ago now, getting close to a couple of decades. Uh, there's, a, I thought, a great question from our friend uh, Jerry Cook at Haynes about corn production. Mm -hmm. uh, and it ties in, I think, to part of what you said about Brazil. You know, you've taken students to Brazil. You've been there a number of times. You talked about what a workhorse they are on the national stage in terms of production. Uh, one of the biggest advantages they have, particularly in that more southern, uh, or I guess in their case, more central part of the country, is uh, the double cropping, right? Like, do we right. think there's a positive potential here for the shorter winter uh, in North America, particularly in the South, uh, that we might could do some of that. You know, most of our yield gains appear to be just in bushels per acre. Will we ever get to a point where we're able to double crop more than just uh, beans and wheat? Well, you know, you really need to talk to an agronomist to get the real answer for that. I don't know. It's very different here than in Brazil because that is a lot of that double cropping is is near the equator. You'll see farmers there plant uh, soybeans in the fall and then follow it with either corn or cotton. And then they even have grassland that they can feed cattle on in between. So um, possibly, but I think more likely what you'll see is an expansion of Brazilian agriculture. Brazilian agriculture is pretty sophisticated. Um, I always tell farmers here that their best friend in terms of competing against Brazil is the Brazilian government <laughs> because they don't provide adequate infrastructure. But if you go visit those farms, those farmers are very innovative. Uh, <laughs> these are not farmers that we're talking about now that are tearing down the uh, Amazon rainforest. If you look at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United States, Brazil still has a lot, I mean like uh, millions and millions of acres that they can bring into production uh, agriculture because they've learned how to now farm that savanna. It's not rainforest, it's savanna as a Cerrado Plain in the Mato Grosso. Uh, so uh, they have a lot of land that they can bring into production and we don't have that here. I mean, we're basically, our productivity in the United States has to hinge on uh, basically improvements in crops, you know, like you talked about, maybe we could do more double cropping, I don't know. But just improvement in general in yields, improvements uh, in fertility and those kinds of things. Whereas Brazil, they're doing all that, but they also have a lot of land that they can expand to uh, to increase. So they're they're going to continue to grow as a major supplier of feed grains. And like I said, they have a very sophisticated poultry and hog industry there. It's funny. You, one of my favorite USDA slides shows the U.S. inputs along the bottom almost static since World War II, but the productivity just you know going off the charts up to the, yes. to the right quadrant. What I hear you saying is Brazil can actually move that inputs part up. They've got more room to grow, more acreage to bring in production, which allows them perhaps to even leapfrog uh, what, we, what we might be able to do with that increased technology. Is that is that fair to say, or am I off base? I think so. I mean, you know, most of the improvement and most of our ability to feed this world population have come through technology improvements. Yeah, there's a good question uh, from our friend uh, Don Mathis down in Sampson County, I believe, if I've got my geography right. That I have heard a lot about the, the, the slaughter weight in pork in particular, that that number has been higher. I get the sense from the industry, and maybe Roy Lee wants to jump in here too, that that's not really ideal. That's not not exactly. They're not necessarily doing that on purpose. Um, uh, any thoughts on that topic, Dr. Brown? We'll start with you, and then see if Roy Lee wants to chime in. Yeah, Roy Lee can add a lot to this, I'm sure. But I think one of the reasons that we saw lighter slaughter weights last year, uh, you know, kind of an ease up in that trend towards higher 
because we've been trending higher slaughter weights for a number of years now. But the reason that it uh, kind of eased up last year was basically feed cost. Uh, and Royal, you are you you can chime in there. I'm sure you have more insight on that than I do, frankly. So, yeah, I think there there are a couple of things that contribute to uh, to the higher slaughter weights. One is when feed costs are high, the goal would be to market a lighter animal. We we would like, I think, most folks in North Carolina would like to be in that 270 to 280 pound market animal. Uh, I think the last. Uh, the last report I saw said we were somewhere around 273 or 274 nationally in terms of what average was. Um, and, and so as feed costs go up every day, you keep them on every day you wait to harvest them, the, the more the feed costs are. So if I can, if I can harvest them sooner then we keep weights down as well as feed costs down. Um, the other thing that is a challenge for us is uh, labor force and, and labor plays a big role in, how efficient our plants can operate. Can they operate at full capacity? Are they limited in terms of where labor is? And this is nationally, I'm not just talking about North Carolina, but, but all across the country. And so uh, we're desperate for workforce within agriculture period. Finding folks that wanna work on the farm all day is a challenge. Uh, where do those folks come from? How do we, uh, how do we make the best use of automation? Uh, and so forth to, to increase productivity without increasing the number of people we have. Um, but we've seen days, I know, where um, market weights have been as high as 285, 290, maybe even higher in, in some of our plants. And it's a function oh, it's of- not, it, in the It's plants. not necessarily intention. Really. No, Is that what you're saying? no, yeah. it's, <clears throat> it's, it's because of what can, we, what can we harvest through the plants on a given day? Um, weather plays a factor, you know, we don't, Fortunately, we don't deal with the blizzards and things that they do in the in the Midwest. But every time you ha have a plant that doesn't run for a day, now you've got you know as a as a country we harvest uh, two and a half million hogs a week, two point three million hogs a week. So if you skip a day, you've now got four hundred thousand hogs that are sitting out there waiting to go back into the system, and there's just not the capacity in the system to accommodate that. So that means you get hogs backed up, and consequently the weights go up. If you have a, a mechanical issue in a plant, you get backed up a day. Now you've got hogs that have to go through those plants um, that how do I accommodate them? And we're already running at near capacity because that's yeah, just how you make this magnitude. work efficiently. The um, sheer magnitude yeah. is mind boggling for sure. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's humbling to see what you all do in that sector and to, to see it happen. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's literally mind boggling. That, that's uh, really, I am jumping in a little bit because we are already over time. And I think there's two other quick questions I want Dr. Brown to respond to. And it's clear this is a great webinar topic. Please feel free to reach out to us and tell us other things you'd like to see programs on or other follow up questions. I know that both Roy Lee and uh, Dr. Brown would be happy to answer additional questions. Um, I did want to just ask at the macro level, uh, Dr. Brown, and I've got a little slide for this that uh, our team here can put up. I did want to ask, you know, this optimism that we're seeing in the markets more generally, not necessarily the ag markets, but, you know, we're looking at an S&P 500 that's on scale to reach 20% returns this calendar year. That, that in light of all the discussion of recession, of all the inflationary pressure that we're receiving, that is hard to square in my mind. I guess we're getting more optimistic about a soft landing, if you will, but, but talk a little bit of just about the macroeconomic situation. And then frankly, we've got to wrap up and uh, on. Sure. And, uh, you know, I'm not a stock expert, but basically I think what you're seeing is that investors are looking at what the Fed has done they're seeing core inflation come down, even though it's not down to their 2% level yet. And so they have some confidence looking at the economy that things are getting better in general. The service sector is still very strong. We have very low unemployment. On the other hand, you have some conflicting signals coming from manufacturing, uh, the home market. Some people, some people have said the home market is already in a recession. Uh, manufacturing has slowed down. Uh, part of that is because we saw a lot of spending in this uh, these two sectors as people came out of COVID. They felt better. They bought houses. Uh, interest rates were still relatively low. They bought a lot of durable goods like appliances and stuff that may have been holding off. And now we're through that and we have higher interest rates. The bond market, you know, we always talk about the yield curve and the yield curve just tells you 
what's the uh, what's the rate of return essentially on, on different treasury bonds for different lengths of maturity. And so normally when we don't expect recession, we see that short-term bonds have a lower payoff than long-term bonds. And that's just the time value of money. But right now we have what's called an inverted yield curve where we're seeing uh, longer term uh, uh, treasuries or bonds pay a higher rate than shorter term. Uh, excuse me, pay a lower rate than shorter term. And a lot of times uh, that's a signal of recession because people think that, well, things are gonna start going not so good economically and the Fed's gonna have to lower interest rates to stimulate the economy. So we expect long-term rates to be lower. Well, there's another reason that that could happen. It could be that rather than people thinking the Fed's gonna have to lower rates, that they think the Fed, that the economy is improving, which will allow the Fed to ease off. So uh, really mixed signals, but right now investors kind of seem to be winning the day thinking that uh, recessionary fears are overblown. And uh, we're seeing surveys of economists come back and say, well, we don't think there's as much danger of a recession now, or at least there's going to be a softer landing. So we're, it's not, it, and there's not black and white. It's, it's kind of a gray area. There's a lot of muck out there in terms of looking at the outlook. But I think that's why you're seeing the stock market react the way it is. Uh, a lot of folks still expect the uh, Fed to go up a quarter rate quarter percent of uh, rate on interest uh, this Wednesday or tomorrow when it's announced. So we'll see. But at any rate, I think people in general feel like the Federal Reserve has done a reasonably good job addressing this situation. And I would tend to agree with that. I mean, it's a very inexact science. It's very hard. It's kind of an art to some extent. But I, I truly believe the Federal Reserve has been very proactive and uh, uh, we'll see how it all turns out in the end, but but I think people have quite a bit of confidence in what they're doing is the other reason that you're seeing the stock, stock market strong. Great response. Uh, and once again, kind of hard to pin this guy down. He's a pretty darn good economist. And uh, I think what you guys in your field like to say is, look, I can tell you the numbers and you can make your own decisions based on those. There you so, go. Mike Walden, our that. famous consumer economist, has his... his uh, his, the title of his articles he writes are always You Decide. You I like Decide. It. I love it. Yeah, I love it. Well, we appreciate that you all decided to be with us uh, here this morning. Uh, appreciate you sticking with us as we've gone a little bit over. Again, please do reach out if you've got follow-up questions for any of the folks that chimed in on the call. I will mention that our Ag Allies in-person conference, our day-long event, will occur at the McKimmon Center this year on October 3rd. We have a phenomenal a program lined up for that. We actually have the chief agricultural economist for Wells Fargo coming in uh, from out of state. We're going to have a, a bit of an ag futurist with us that morning. And then I'm working on, I can't quite confirm this, but uh, your hint would be that one of our panelists may be a real believer in this new era of alternative protein. And so I uh, hope we can get that worked out. You see the chambers plugged into a lot of things, the workforce development field, the healthcare field. Uh, and so there are other offerings there. Also, uh, we concentrate and do think it's important to be intentional about our work in the DEI space. And so there's other upcoming events there that you can pay attention to and plug into if you'd like, but we're humbled and grateful you were with us today. Have a great afternoon. Look for this recording over email. Uh, be safe out there. Thanks a ton for joining us. Take care.